Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to this session. I know it's quite late for some of you. And uh, just a few things about me before we start. I like to make a lot of jokes. And uh, so hopefully everybody relax. Um, we're missing a bit of the audience. But uh, so the topic today is about actually innovation and digital solutions, uh, partly in Europe, but mostly global. So my name is Mohamed Ba, and I'm the head of uh, innovation at uh, an organization called the International Telecommunication Union, for those of you who don't know the ITU. But it's a lead uh, UN agency for ICTs. So our job is to help connect the world. Um, I knew at ITU only four years, 18 years in the private sector, working for big technology companies, so that's my background. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce our panelists today, and I'll let them introduce themselves briefly, and then we can get going. Can we start? Okay. I'm Lorenzo Di Chancio from Italy. I'm the CEO and founder of Pedius. It's an app that allows deaf people to make phone calls using text-to-speech and voice recognition technology. So I have an IT background, and I am a, I can consider a social entrepreneur because I uh, use technology to create new way to do business, and I used also to teach that in the university. Thank you. Okay. Um, hello. My, my name is Jelko Kermaier, and uh, I come from a company, Philip. Um, we invented technology that enables blind people to feel pictures and shapes on a touch screen. So now, uh, based on this technology, we develop different applications where this uh, technology can be applied. And these uh, applications range from education, entertainment, uh, and uh, everyday practical apps. Go ahead. Hello. Good afternoon. My name is Natalia Melina, and I'm from UNESCO Institute for Information Technologies and Education, which is located in Moscow. I work for this institute almost 15 years. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have IT background. I have pedagogical background, but uh, all this time I'm working in the field of education for in and information and communication technologies. Okay. Yeah. Um, my name is Masahito Kamori. I'm representing the International Telecommunication Union. I'm a rapporteur of the, um, in the multimedia group, study group 16 of ITUT, and standardizing accessibility, ICTs. My background in the, I, I'm, I'm also a professor at a university in Japan, and um, my background, before that I was a researcher at a telco in Japan. So I, I have a, sort of a telco background, technology background. And um, I'm currently um, uh, just standardizing <clears throat> ICT accessibility uh, for the blind as well as uh, deaf people uh, to make their life more accessible. Thank you. Thank you. Let me ask you, how many people in this audience are policy makers? Policy? No. Startups? Startups? Okay, great. And academia? Academia? Excellent. Uh, people with money? Financiers? Anybody with money or giving money to people like these startups? No. Yes. One, two. Excellent. Uh, what about support network? Anybody from an incubator, an accelerator, an association, any of those? Association for disability for different purposes? Yes. Okay. So, and uh, private sector, corporates, organizations? Excellent. Not that many, but we have what we call the ecosystem represented here. Now, we'll have a bit of understanding through this session how this ecosystem has to work together. 
And, uh, but before that, I'd like to invite some of our panelists to present uh, briefly um, their good practices or what they're doing. With that, I'd like to start with Natalia. Can we have Natalia's presentation? Okay, you decided to start with me, <laughs> from me. Okay, uh, again, greetings from the UNESCO Institute for Information Technologies and Education. Uh, in spite of the fact that um, ITU and UNESCO has, have different uh, missions and different areas uh, of work, um, any of the United Nation, Nations agencies are working in the field of the Sustainable Development Goals, as you know. Uh, and starting to consider the topic uh, which brings us today here, I would like to pay your attention that since the end of the 20th century, there has been a significant and rapid change in delivery of the educational content for all students. The use of internet and web-based instructional tools, um, once thought experimental, is now viewed as integral part of the general teaching learning process. The use of digital technologies for distance education and networking for uh, people with disabilities offers promises in meeting the needs of students, I would say, with every kind of disability. Um, do, do, do we have a slider? Oh, or next, <laughs> next. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Let me say, uh, let me inform you briefly about our institute. UNESCO Institute for Information Technologies in, edu in Education was established in Moscow and we are the only institute of UNESCO which is dealing directly with information and communication technologies in education. Uh, our mission is to provide technical assistance and support to all UNESCO member states for implementation of and integration of information and communication technologies in different forms and levels of education. We have different programs, starting from ICT in primary, from pre-primary education for kindergarten even, and uh, we have projects on secondary education, technical and vocational education, higher education, and one of the oldest projects of our institute is devoted to information and communication technologies in education and social inclusion of persons with disabilities. Different types of um, impairments we are covering, uh, sensory impairments, speech and language impairments, uh, motor or physical impairments, and so on. Uh, during more than, I would say, 20, around 20 years, we uh, arranged a number of international conferences and workshops on this topic. We developed a number of recommend policy recommendations and um, collected best practices on it, uh, developed training courses, training materials. Uh, but today I would like to share with you our um, pilot project, uh, which we have been implemented together with International Telecommunication Union, its regional office for CIS countries. Again, it is located in Moscow, and since 2010, we have established already six specialized IT centers for persons with disabilities in such countries as um, two centers in, in the Republic of Belarus, uh, uh, in the Republic of Armenia, Kyrgyzstan, Moldova, and in the Russian Federation. Something I... Okay, yes, six, uh, six centers. The main idea of such centers were as following. First of all, all these centers were equipped with specialized 
um, hardware and software for persons with disabilities. Uh, it is a platform for providing open access to information and knowledge for persons with disabilities. It means that every person who has this or that type of disability can come and get um, information, can get support from the experts how to deal with different technologies. And uh, in addition to it, uh, such centers became uh, um, a point for professional development, for professional development of specialists who are involved in education and rehabilitation and social inclusion of persons with disabilities. Um, now we are working uh, on networking model uh, and we have a new partner which is Cultural and Sport Rehabilitation Center, which is located in, in Moscow, of the All Russia um, Visually Impaired Association. Uh, it is the biggest association in the Russian Federation of visually impaired persons, and they have more than 70 regional offices. So our idea is to create a network networking model and to support ICT competency development of those who are interested in their career, first of all, of people with visual impairments. So I think that, that's all. <laughs> well, th thank you, Natalia. I, I want to bring it back a bit more to reality. Thanks for the great work in terms of the projects you're doing to try to solve the pr uh, problem with technology in various countries. Uh, I want to bring this back to actually the startup community, right? Because this is one model where we have a center, right? which is trying to bring technology to people and etc. On the other hand, we have policy makers who are trying to standardize. We'll come back to this later. But in your own world, right, you are developing problems, trying to solve problems. I had a chance to talk to Natalia earlier to try to understand who is involved in it. I think one of the questions I ask is, do you have the startup community involved in your work? And the answer was no, correct? And uh, all of us represent different communities here. And the problem of innovation is everybody working together, right? You're developing solutions, things that need to be standardized, things that need to be collaborated with. Can you tell us more and comment on what Natalia is doing and how you see yourself fit in this picture? Oh, we can use this, okay. So this is a very good question. As a startup, we are, say, pretty old to be considered a startup yet, because we started a company five years ago. And we got luck that we got funded uh, having in our uh, stakeholder um, Telecom Italia was the, the national uh, phone provider. So we were expecting, it was like corporate venture capital that was investing to try to create the ecosystem. Yeah. And for us it's very, it worked in a different separate compartment. Like we had some contact with the university, but it's very hard to combine the pure pu research from the university and the practical research that we are doing every day. Mm -hmm. Our team now, we have half of our um, team is ITR developers, yeah. and it's a, a couple of, out of six developers, one is to do maintenance, and, and five are doing the new development. So it's very hard to also to reuse and share. We would very like to create a community to share those achievements in research. But it's very hard because we work with the voice recognition technology. There are a lot of universities making study about that, and the study that they share probably are not mature enough to get on on the market. So we have to do the last mile of development, and this could be like um, probably we need some player that help us to cooperate. To cooperate. Okay. So we have a center. We have a startup mm -hmm. who's developing IP. He's saying that there is a lot of research being done in universities. He doesn't have access to those researches necessarily. He needs to do a lot of work, but it's not happening. So we have a collaboration issue, right? 
I would like to turn to our policy makers, right, who's trying to standardize maybe things that you are doing. Can you tell us more about your work at the ITU to make this happen? And we'll hack this. If you guys don't mind, we'll skip the presentations because I want this to be quite interactive. At the end, I will just present a few slides. Or if you guys would like to present, you can present. Okay. Uh, in ITU, ITUT, actually. Um, I'm working with the uh, standardization. Um, ITU is very unique in that um, it's the oldest, uh, in addition to being the oldest international organization uh, established in 1850, oh, 1855 or 65 or something like that. And, um, and also it has, um, in addition to 193 governments, uh, we have companies. <clears throat> and uh, ITU is the only United Nations agency that has commercial entities as members. So that means we can um, negotiate, we can talk with um, uh, companies, we can mediate between policymakers, regulators, as well as solution providers. And we also have academia members, like, um, like my university, and uh, so we can, we can put in research results as well as new ideas. We can take in requirements from regulatory perspective as well as from a commercial pers perspective because we have commercial uh, companies. So shall I start the presentation or? It's up to you. I'm yeah. completely hacking it because I want this to be quite interactive. Please okay. feel free not to use the slides. Okay, okay. so then I can, I can give a background. Oh. Yes, a little bit more, and so that uh, people can understand I what we're doing. I yeah. Go to the audience as well. Okay. So, uh, in terms of um, um, accessibility, so I um, we're doing so as so the general background is that uh, we have companies, uh, governments, regulators, and academia coming together to work on standards, um, and uh, particular in particular in our group, uh, it's a multimedia group. Uh, we work on uh, e-services, e-health, uh, and accessibility. So in the, in the area of uh, health care and medicine, we work with, for example, World Health Organization. In the case of um, accessibility, we're, we work with the deaf community, like World Federation of the Deaf, or International Federation of Hard of Hearing, or the, the World Blind Union. So those, we can get, um, as well as... Um, uh, in addition to regulatory perspective, we can also get the user's perspective because we, we do have users in our group, okay? I want to go to the audience. Um, so far we talked to, you know, uh, UNESCO who is putting centers with ITU. We talked to uh, policy makers who is making standards happen. The startups are doing some technologies that don't have access to all the communities, right? But these guys can help you in some ways. Um, anybody from the money side on, in the audience? I think on this side we talk about money, right? Now, the reason why I bring money is how have you worked in this type of communities before? These guys have not brought it up yet in terms of what their needs are, right? Or anybody from the, any other uh, groups that we talk about, policymakers or corporate, how do you see yourself involved in, the, in an ecosystem who is developing uh, technologies for uh, inclusion? Anybody in the audience would like to take this? Yes, please go ahead, use your mic. Um, hi, I'm Martin uh, from Smart in Life. I'm not so much uh, in the development of solution, but I think it's the big challenge of bringing what is there to the people. And um, especially if you look simply at the uh, smartphone te technology and the number of features included in any single phone, that uh, the number of accessibility features included in a single phone. And then you look at the user groups who could benefit from it, you see that 99% uh, of the potential really b b beneficiaries of this technology don't apply it because they don't have any clue about it. And I think this is really where it comes in to have uh, also uh, assistive technology professor professionals 
to train the trainers and really make aware, okay, what is out there, what can be used, uh, how, uh, which basic features like, uh, yeah, uh, like uh, magnifying, etc., so uh, speech output can be used. Uh, and I think there's still a big gap, and especially uh, to relate from UNESCO, it's really about, okay, uh, it's not just putting the technology there, but really train the trainers in a broad field and uh, making them aware on the, on the existing features. Okay, so, but does it mean that uh, people are not collaborating to do this? What do you see as the challenge? I see the one uh, one-sided challenge really from the big operators, uh, not only the operators, but especially the uh, uh, operating system developers and manufacturers. Mm. They spend millions on getting their uh, accessibility features in, and they don't talk about it enough. So yesterday, mm. we uh, at the keynote of Microsoft, it was really great to see. Okay, yeah, let's bring an yeah. assistive technology to the. Uh, to the Super Bowl uh, commercial break. Yeah, that's yeah. the way to do it. Yeah. But it's also about really, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, it's Putting in the hands of people. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, I was in an earlier session around noon there where the world needed another 36, uh, <laughs> and I'm going to joke on this one, uh, another browser. But, and, and, and my question then was, well, do we really need another browser? Yes, we need a browser for to assist uh, in you know in inclusion. But then the presenter explained or that they needed this because you know it's not happening with other people, right? But then my point was this technology, right? So you have the Microsoft of the world who are spending a lot of money. Shouldn't there be more collaboration instead, right? Because you have technology that needs to actually find its way in solving a problem, right? The two gentlemen here are solving problems in the marketplace, right? At the same time, we also heard from one of them that there were actually a lot of technologies developed in research labs that he does not have access to. Problem number one. Problem number two, the corporate have all these technologies. It's not getting in the marketplace to solve problems, right? Problem number three. We have different stakeholders doing different initiatives, like programs that are there to help this community. Again, there is a disconnect there. Can you think of any other disconnect you see in building a community that's supporting technologies for inclusions? This is open to the audience. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to argue I think you're taking the wrong approach from yes. the beginning, because what you're talking about is organizations coordinating. What you need to discuss is the functions that different types of organization are providing. So it is about, it's not about whether or not you're running a center, whether you're a startup. Uh -huh. It's who provides training? Who raises awareness? Who provides technical support? What is the provision model? Now, they can be drawn from NGOs and disability organizations. They can be from the private sector. They can be from the public sector. Uh -huh. You asked a question about funding. One of the things that we don't know when we go to private sector investors very few people are able to give accurate predictions of return on investment because actually we don't understand the market properly. Uh -huh. The statistics, the data around disability, access, inclusion, the elderly, uh, situational disability are extremely poor. So to raise money from investors is actually very, very difficult. And I think any startup that's been successful has done an amazing job. But I think I would say, say you, know, you should move away from thinking what is the role of a center to thinking how is training and development delivered within a community to meet the needs of the people there. That might be a private sector organization. It might mm. even be an app developer runs mm -hmm. it. Or it might be a training center, as we heard from, uh, from Russia and from UNESCO. I think these are the factors that we really need to take into account. Because if we think about it as separate organizations and people, we will always have a disconnect. It is the functions that draw us together to collaborate, not the organizations. Okay. I, I agree with you. I started asking, I said, who is from which group? The next question I should have asked, does each group know what their role is? Yes? That's the question. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I, I think David is 
right in that uh, not the organization, not an organization that. Uh, uh, so he he talked about needs, right? So I, I think there's a lack of knowledge about the needs. What you, you just talked about the solutions the private companies have, the big guys like Google and Microsoft, and uh, but they they they're not used in the inclusion uh, area. The reason is they don't know. They don't know the requirements of the inclusion society, in inclusive society. They have those uh, very good uh, solutions, but since they don't know, they don't apply it. You know, if we have a sort of a forum in which we can um, explicitly state our needs, disability needs for uh, persons with disabilities, and, and also a platform for education, then I think we can have a better, how shall I say, value chain or, you know, ecosystem of inclusive, inclusive technologies. Mm -hmm. um, let me ask you different questions. And I'll, this is open for anybody. In your own community, have you identified all the stakeholders who have a stake in inclusion with technology? And if you have, have you done anything with them? Open question again for the audience. Yes, go ahead. Um, yes, um, in our case, we are working with blind and visually impaired, and uh, uh, we uh, determine who our stakeholders are. So it, they are from uh, parents of blind children, teachers, um, and uh, caretakers, and also we included uh, software developers and content creators. And um, uh, to maximize our impact, we are now in a stage of building uh, what we call the Philip Open Platform. It's an um, it's a, um, app uh, or content store, app and content store. So what we did, we developed um, uh, tools which, with which uh, teachers can create uh, um, tactile books these books we called feel books, so they can create content which can be then played on, uh, on our devices so that blind people can, uh, can uh, access them. So this is like a PowerPoint for a blind, and the teacher can do it so you don't need a programmer, a uh, software developer to, to, to create a content. So um, and, and now we are in this stage that we want to build this open platform so that uh, on this platform, everybody can create content and exchange it for free or, or to, to be paid for that. And in that way, what we hope to achieve is that uh, this good content will emerge up, you know, um, and uh, uh, good ideas will emerge. And these good ideas will be then will be able to quickly exchange between this community and uh, um, um, so, so everybody will benefit. So that uh, uh, good ideas and good ap applications or good uh, good books for for uh, for uh, for uh, for blind and visually impaired people will be exchanged and uh, uh, um, used. C can you can you walk us through Philip's journey in making this happen? You know, how did Felix get started? What were your challenges in getting started? How did you get into the using technology to make this happen? You talk a little bit about the stakeholders, but walk us through the challenges you face and what have you not solved that yeah. you need the community here to take notice of? Yeah, um, well, yeah, these are, these are three different questions you asked now. Mm -hmm. So um, I can give you a little bit of background uh, how, how we started and then go to, uh, to this. Uh, so um, we started uh, it, it, everything started with an, uh, with an idea. Um, actually, I was watching a television show, a documentary about deaf-blind people. So these are people who are deaf and blind at the same time. So um, uh, I watched that and I was really uh, deeply moved uh, by, by this documentary. And um, I, I felt uh, strongly that there, this is wrong, that they cannot communicate and they are just uh, left there by the society and that nobody cares, they're just waiting for a social worker to bring them food and that's it, you know. 
So, um, uh, so I then thought uh, if I want to enable them, you know, to communicate um, uh, remotely, um, the best thing would be if they would be able to use a smartphone and um, uh, because they are accessible. But to understand the problem, it is if you are deaf and blind, you cannot use a smartphone because you cannot hear other person what they are saying, you know, on the other uh, and, uh, um, and the deaf and blind people, they use tactile language and this is done by touching other person's hand, you know, so you need somebody there to talk with them. You know, cannot talk with 10 people at the same time, only with one, which is immediately there close to you. So, um, so th that is how I, how I got an idea, you know, to, um, to use uh, vibrations. I, I actually punched the holes in my business card and I placed it over the top of the touch screen and I felt that I can film with my finger in which hole I am, you know, if, if, if I am in the first hole, the second, and then the, also the phone knew where I was touching and I could then use vibrations and uh, with vibration that was the, the basic principle of uh, this special braille alphabet, you know. And um, uh, we developed software, we tested it, and again, we tested, uh, it means uh, only one uh, deaf-blind person, uh, because there are, there are two million deaf-blind person worldwide, you know. So Slovenia, country I'm from, has two million population. That, uh, so in this uh, Slovenia, I could get access only to one deaf-blind person who also knew a braille. And uh, it took half an hour for that gentleman, you know, to know how to read and write his name with uh, our device. So that was a great success. So, uh, for, so in this process, you know, we uh, wanted also to get some, um, some finances because uh, I was financing this through, uh, from my own uh, money. I had another company, which is digital agency, so with, with this we finance all this. If I didn't have that, I could, wouldn't be able to be now here or to develop anything what we, what we did. So, um, so uh, then we, in this process, learned, uh, uh, met blind people because before that I never talked with blind people. I didn't, I didn't, I don't have nobody who is blind or they're blind in my family, you know. So I, 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 met, I talked with them and I realized the, the problems they face. And so then we turned to uh, this technology uh, into technology which enables blind people to feel pictures and shapes on a touch screen which is a big thing because uh, uh, right now accessibi accessibility technology for a blind is a, it's a based on a screen reader. So right now only a screen reader reads the content of a, of a web page or whatever they have and uh, that's it. That's how they perceive internet or uh, uh, any digital content. And um, we know because now most content is uh, based, uh, is the, it, it requires um, visual information, it, it has visual information, and uh, they are um, deprived of that. And uh, what, we, what we want to do, you know, sometimes if you want to learn what is a square function, what is a sine function, if you want to learn how, how somebody's face looks like, you know, you need to feel it, you know. And um, that's, what we, that's what we did with Philip. And uh, uh, we started first with the schools, you know, so this is now getting to your, to your questions. We went there to the school and we get a great feedback from the teachers. Um, it, was, uh, it was actually that um, the problem that we, that we realized there was that um, uh, when I talked about uh, this technology and how, how it works and uh, why do people, uh, why are people able to feel something and to feel the shape? Um, a lot of people don't understand it, even if they are experts in the field, for instance, like a computer teacher for a blind people in this school in Slovenia, I, we presented. And then when, we, when I give them the prototype to try it, you know, it was a completely different. They, they came to me and said, wow, this thing really works. This is really cool, <laughs> which, which in translation means before, before you say, before you, where you were just uh, talking and I didn't try it, I thought this cannot work, you know. So um, that is one problem we had to also uh, solve and we are solving it still, you know, how to, uh, when you want to commercial, uh, commercialize the product, you know, you need to be able to persuade people that this really works without giving everybody a product to try it, you know, and then so they can, uh, they can believe you, you know. So, um, 
to, to, to solve this, we, we went uh, uh, on uh, different uh, competitions. Uh, we just deliberately signed up for, for them. And uh, we got uh, a lot of prizes and awards. So we are also, we won, uh, we, are, we are the best social innovation in, in Europe. And we want also some, from uh, WSA uh, the best innovation in the world. And the UNESCO also enlisted us in a, on a list of 150 innovations that will change the world. So, uh, so by that, we, are start, we started getting more and more of this, uh, let's say, uh, social proof. And uh, the, ma the, the most important thing was we also started connecting with, uh, with parents of blind uh, children. In Slovenia, there is an association of parents of blind children. And uh, they gave us a lot of uh, moral support and uh, practical support, uh, emotional support. And uh, they also became our first uh, uh, users and ambassadors. And uh, th this is where we, where we where we uh, got um, a lots of uh, um, lots of positive energy that keeps us, you know, in, a t in when, when the times were tough, you know, which give us, you know, this energy to 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 go to proceed. Um, and one more thing I want to say, and then uh, um, I, I will finish. Uh, the another thing which is very important it is to to get funding. You know, I think that is that is this is a very important thing. And um, it is uh, also very hard to, uh, to, to get funding. Um, now, um, how, how we solved it, you know, we, I, was, I was fortunate enough that I had some, uh, some other company which was, uh, which was making money, you know, and I could spend uh, uh, some of that, you know, on, uh, on uh, this uh, new, uh, new product, a uh, new idea. And uh, so we hired uh, 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 experts who are good in preparing uh, 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 documentation for projects because my mind, I am an engineer, innovator, you know, my mind is not for writing these uh, documentations and presenting projects uh, to bureaucrats, you know, who then decide if this is okay or not. And because we had, we had this money, we invested that, and that's, that this is how we got, uh, got our first grants. And uh, then we also got investors and uh, so on. So, but Th that was the most important step, and I, I think that if I didn't have some capital before, you know, that I invested by myself, I, I wouldn't be able to, to do that, because that is just uh, too, uh, too complicated for me. Well, thank you. I, I think this story resonates with most entrepreneurs around the world, except if you live in Silicon Valley or you're born with a silver spoon in your mouth, right? Which means you can afford all these things. Um, Lorenzo, what is your experience with this? And I'm going to come back to the audience. So I think in, in, in technology for inclusion, probably the biggest limit is, is the funding. Because it's, before the funding is defining a business model. Mm -hmm. Because most of the time, um, people try to, to create a, a medical device, so you get stuck in the process to get recognized as a device. And because research is very expensive, and it's not a price that we um, um, suitable for consumer. Mm -hmm. In Paris, what we did is uh, starting with a philosophical pricing. So the question, how much a deaf person should pay making a phone call? And we start, okay, the price is the same as anybody else. So if the technology is good enough, we should reach this level. Otherwise, our project will fail. Then we, we after like uh, four years, we will be able even to do more than that. We provide the app for free, and we provide free phone calls up to 20 minutes every month. So companies are starting to pay for that. So the, our company changed the pace when we were able to find a way to cooperate with companies, and we find the interest of company to be accessible. And this is how our company is starting to be sustainable at the moment. But when we uh, met a lot of investors, and one of the answer we got pretty often is nobody will bid on this ability. There is no business on that. So probably from my point of view, this is the biggest challenge. Find a business model and then convince investors yeah. that it will be sustainable. Okay, so money is an issue. And by the way, this, this idea of people going to competition to get started is everywhere. I am told a lot of ecosystems are very nice. But when we start assessing them to see how entrepreneurs are getting started, how they are addressing problems, whether they're addressing problems with the right business model, because that's always part of the getting the money part right. You have to have a business model. 
we find this everywhere. But it's not the only challenge. You did not talk about this. You're developing technology. There's a lot of intellectual property there. Somebody can copy your thing. So there's a lot of other things there, especially if it's technology. Well, how did you solve that? Did you solve it? Uh, yes, of course. We have uh, patented our technology. Um, we have uh, uh, one, uh, one uh, uh, we are fortunate because our technology uh, to work depends on a piece of, uh, let's say, plastic uh, relief grid that must be placed on a, mm -hmm. on a touch screen. And because of that, this is, this is a piece of hardware and the software, and it can be patented even in Europe. And so we patented it all over the world. And we are now in this process of, uh, of, uh, of uh, getting the patent, yeah. Okay, thank you. Anybody from the audience would like to comment? Then I'll walk you through a quick snapshot on the problem we see. Anybody in the audience? Okay, so let's get back to where we're here. We're here to talk about ecosystem. And I think we're just starting touching on some of these issues we're looking at. My job is to help countries build their ecosystem, their digital innovation ecosystem. Now, I'll tell you a little bit more about this. I love this quote. It says, entrepreneurship without innovation is trading. We have a lot of traders out there. And innovation without entrepreneurship is creativity. All these fancy spaces where we tell people to go to these incubators, accelerators, at the end of the day, you have to have something, right? So it's not creativity and entrepreneurship together. So our biggest failure that we see, you guys are going through this valley of death, right? So what does this mean? In this valley of death, it's actually at the bottom of this valley, you have a product. Yes, that's why it's negative. In some countries, in some communities, this looks like an abyss. You actually don't want to get in there. A lot of people are trying to get in there. Now, you happen to watch TV. <laughs> You are passionate about the topic. I think for most entrepreneurs, we can say that. Well, a lot of good entrepreneurs, we can say that. For other entrepreneurs, we have many governments who are pushing them to entrepreneurship because we know why. Because there's a lot of you know, value and there's a lot of jobs going away in different ways, right? Now, when you come out, do you consider yourself an SME? Do you, are you profitable? Or are you still subsidizing with your other business? No, we, we got an uh, investment and we are now uh, burning this investment money, okay. uh, but uh, we, are, we, are, we will be uh, profitable in this year. Yeah. Okay, so you're hoping to be profitable in this year, yes. so you'll get out somewhere, right? Yeah. Are you profitable? Not yet. Okay. We'll be like 50% um, of expenses, so we're still ramping up the red area. Other entrepreneurs here, where are you? Are you at the, still in the valley of death or are you out? So you're at the beginning of the Valley of Death, or you're at the end, at the, by the SME. Pre-startup, interesting, which is <laughs> even more challenging. Um, all of you here have a role. I think the gentlemen back there did talk about the role. Instead of talking about this center, this and that, let's understand whose role it is and what we're doing. Now, we have come from very far, right? From our agrarian systems to a world where we have to think about globalization. The minute any of you guys have an idea with technology and you create a company solving a problem like inclusion, right? Disabilities and different type of disabilities, you are competing globally. Somebody else can copy your technology. If your business model is not strong enough, if you do not have access to this talent, like you say, you're an engineer. I'm an engineer by profession. I learned to be a business person and now a policy maker. But in reality, you need all these talents. Is your ecosystem providing you these talents? Is it <coughs> providing you the financing, right? So this is what we want in the world, right? These are the SDGs. This is what we live, right? We're talking about all these things replacing us, right? I'll skip this, but uh, in reality, what we see in your ecosystem is the same as most ecosystem. We have a lot of technology out there, right? Especially in developed countries. The technology is not the problem. If I go to Korea, 
There is something I used to hate. It's called the fancy smart toilet. But once you use it, you understand it's actually nice. But in reality, you go somewhere else, they need a lower end technology to solve a different problem. And they don't have this technology. This gap is really growing. At the ITU, we can measure this several ways. We can look at the internet penetration. You can see that technology, just an internet technology, which allows the connectivity. There is a growing gap between countries, and part of the gap is because there is no innovation capacity. Young people like you and you, right? Or maybe not so young, <laughs> I'm not young either, <laughs> will struggle to actually solve this problem, right? Now, if you ask all the stakeholders, that's why I ask all of you, what are your challenges, right? This is what people are saying. You said you need access to this technology in the labs. You don't have access. You said you need money. The finance guy is looking for the next Google. Government is thinking of some fancy terms or some new things they're trying to do, right? They're not talking to you. They don't understand your communities, right? There is a problem everywhere, right? That's because people don't speak the same language. And I'll skip this, the slide will be available, but I want to show you something. In all countries, there is some kind of vision to reach something, right? The problem is not a vision. The vision is not important. You know why? Anybody knows this slide? This is a Gardner hype cycle. Technology comes and goes. People are not able to navigate and take this technology and turn it into productive use for society. Why? Because again, that ecosystem is not there. You have just expressed that in different ways. Inclusion, 1%, 99%. This is in everywhere, right? All of you are from some communities. I think everybody dream of some capabilities. Everybody dream of the Silicon Valley. What are the people in your communities talking about? They wanna be like Silicon Valley? What is your own dream? Do you want to go to Silicon Valley or do you want to develop technologies for your community? Question. Rhetorical question. I know the answer for some people. When you look at the stakeholders and their role at the 10-foot level, what are they doing? Right? So we dream of nurturing these competitive communities, but we fail to lead in our mission, right? One of the reasons when you talk about stakeholders, because all those stakeholders are looking at the command and control. This is how they're operating. But they're not looking at the paradigm where they need to be collaborating more and more together. And this is where the ecosystem comes in, right? And I think for most communities, if you're gonna develop an ecosystem that will support technology for any purpose, including inclusions, which is the topic we're here to discuss today, you can fail this, right? Now, the next frontier really to drive inclusion is about having the right ecosystem, which is those stakeholders have to come together, understand their role, and actually drive the transformation so that people like you, you, or you, are able to drive these technologies and solve real problems. We do this study comparatively for every country, every city, if you want. This is what we say. So at the top is the valley, right? This is the same slide. So as an entrepreneur, sorry, this is not that visible, but the first thing is, do you have entrepreneurial interest on this topic in your community? You, how many people in doing, dealing inclusion uh, businesses in your technology in Slovenia? Mm. Uh, how many people? Uh, well, are you the only one doing these sort of technologies, or do you have a community? Is there an entrepreneurial interest? Um, uh, for what, what, we, what, what we do, we are working with blind and visually impaired, and what we developed is uh, so unique uh, that uh, okay. nobody else is doing that. So in, in your community, you're the only one looking at this, this type of technologies for inclusion. Yes. Same for you? Say that different approach, but uh, it's kind of co -co cooperation because it's, so, it's helping create awareness. So the yeah. so very little interest in this community. Mm -hmm. I think it was said before, right? Engage with problem. Are they engaging to solve the right problems? Are they developing the right business model? Are they building the collaboration with the big companies? 
right? And are they able to expand? Now, finance, you mentioned money. Do you have seed fund? You didn't have access to seed fund. You have to use your own funding. Did you have an angel investment who understand this technology? No, you did not have it. So these are the kind of things we have to think about when we talk ecosystem. Because if you don't have this, you have no chance of crossing this valley. Well, you can, you can waste your, well, not waste, but you, you can subsidize it because you're lucky to have another business, but it's very difficult. In most working ecosystem, you will find that all this is green, yes? Let's look at another problem you mentioned. You mentioned uh, research. We can color code this in your ecosystem to see where we are with research, right? And the same with actually the vision of the public policy. I ask people, are you policy makers here? Is there a policy where the governments or the administration or the cities are trying to create this community and they have actually set a vision and strategy to do this? If it's not there, then all these guys are operating in silos, right? So, and then there's all these other things with it. So, what we typically have around the world, if we wanna foster digital transformation, is three type of ecosystem have to come together. You have your national innovation system, which is the research, science, academia, all of those things that you might need to access, and we might need to convert some of their granting and research in this topic. Then you have an entrepreneurial ecosystem, which is usually there, but without it being connected to the other ecosystem, it's no use. Without it being connected to a technology ecosystem, it's no use, because you need these three to come together to make things happen. So, the question, can we do this for inclusion? Why do we need to do this? Why do we need to do this? We know why we have to do this if we want to accelerate the transformation of technology impacting this problem, right? Change is inevitable. Most ecosystems function like this. Big fish, do you want to be the big fish or the small fish? Right, fighting each other, but the whaling boat is coming. Because as I said, every technology company is connected to the same global ecosystem. You think you have a technology, somebody else can copy it, are you protected? Do you have the resources so you can scale because it's a numbers game again? Do you have the community you need to be able to, to, to really transform your business, right? Well, this is a bit what I do, right? Because what we have at the ITU is we created a platform and in there we try to take communities through a transformation process to create actually relevant evidence-based programs. I won't talk about that, you can talk to me offline. Uh, but what I wanna do, and I'm gonna check time, we have 30 minutes to do organized chaos and we're gonna answer a couple of questions. I'm not gonna move you around because we don't have time for this, but I want you to think about why you're here, and I want you to turn around to this group, that group, this group, and talk to each other and say what are you trying to achieve and why you have not achieved it. Then I will ask you a question, okay? Can we do that? Just turn around, talk with each other, right? And then I'm gonna go and ask you. So just turn around, yes. Same. So share, and then I'll ask some people to share what they're. So we got it? Okay, we have five minutes to do this. Very few good contacts to, to scale up at the beginning. Can I present my presentation too? Yeah, you can. Okay. When? I, and there's. Yeah, well. I can ask them to switch it after. Yeah, okay. Yeah, was well, the, um, the scaling process is more finding the right partner and, and close few deal but good deal. Mm -hmm. So that is. Uh, 
the ecosystem is helping Barrios. Now it's possible even to move. So we, we find we, we went to like as recently when we were here in Austria. So it's also considering this possibility. Uh -huh. I do not consider protecting the IP because it's, if someone copy, at the end we'd be good. And also if you don't have money to protect. Or go to them to standardize it. <laughs> so you yeah. can build on the next value layers. That would be depends on your property. I mean, yeah, it's uh -huh. Yeah. Of using your IP, in order to make money from IP, yeah. or you, you you use your IP to protect your technology, yeah. or you don't disclose anything like Coca-Cola. Yeah. They have an IP, but they they never say we have an IP. Yeah. They don't want to show it. Okay. So it depends. And, and it, as as far as the ecosystem is concerned, you know, it's always the big guy that has the money. And in your case, it's uh, Telcom Italia, right, mm -hmm. for example? Yeah, yeah, but the, the concept of ecosystem is broader than that because that's a technology ecosystem. We have an entrepreneurial ecosystem, we have an innovation yeah, system. For example, we were struggling yeah. for two years by uh, an investor. Yeah. When we closed the deal with Telecom Italia, we got like a lot of investors was willing to put in money. So the, the big player should be the first mover and then the other will yeah. follow up. Okay. Look at what, uh, what happened to Microsoft when he just started it. Mm -hmm. The very important step was that uh, Bill Gates got a deal with IBM. True. Mm -hmm. It's a demand. Well, the same with Steve Jobs. no, it's, that's not the ecosystem. I, I'm sorry. Here, this is the demand part. It's really all the demand that's needed from that side. Right. Well, I did put the definition of ecosystem up, right? And it's before. Just to be clear, because I always like to clarify these things. So this is, okay, here. There you go. That's the definition. So, this is so are we doing here? What is, yeah, we're together. You no, 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 no. Okay. And you can. All right. So I'm gonna ask some groups to share their discussion quickly. So can we start with this group? Would you like to share your discussion here? We're not done yet. But you haven't done. Okay, I'll skip you then. So, would you like to share your discussion with the team? Well, there is similar trace. <laughs> we have uh, uh, talked to each other about our uh, own some kind of startup or maybe we have a project. Yeah. So, what are your challenges then? Tell us about your challenges. And did that match anything these gentlemen up there were talking about? Challenges. Mm -hmm. um, for example, we're talking about um, patent issues. Yeah. So um, we were basically told that B is not a it's expensive, B it takes too long, and C yeah. we don't have the resources to depend on. Yes. So, so why bother? So why so bother is somebody like the government should have a program to help you take that burden away from you. So you lessen the death valley. Sure. But that should yeah. is different from the reality. So when you're down in the trenches trying yeah. to develop a business. Correct. Governments up here have a business. Correct. So, so you can either so that's, that's the whole point, right? So when we do a framework, and actually, what, when I do this, I do this in country, I'll put 100 people in the room from yeah. all walks of life, governments, and governments, everybody. And the first thing we have to agree to understand together what it is that we're trying to solve. And then we'll color code that picture that I shared with you. And based on this picture, then we will actually, what we'll do, we'll create programs to solve it because that's what's missing, right? If IP is color-coded red here, then because I do this comparatively, I can tell you in this country or this city, there's a really good model. And if you want, because that's your role, 
Yeah. You put this program forward. So you have to mature the ecosystem. In reality, it doesn't mean it's the case, but if you want to have this ability to navigate any technology to solve a problem, you have to start addressing it in different ways, right? But I understand when you are in the trenches, you're yeah. just trying to do, but this is the point. This, yeah. You shouldn't be in the trenches by yourself because <laughs> all these guys have to pick their role. They have to do what they need to do. Everyone is yeah. assigned something to do here. And I also get, get the notion of collaborating yes. with the big guys, but the big guys don't want to talk yes. because they're, they circle the wagons around their IP. So I can give you an example. Um, I, one of my customers that we support is um, she's a young, young woman with profound intellectual disabilities. So that's one, uh, one challenge, uh, yeah. Yeah. it's the collaboration with the big guys. Yeah, because yeah. disability yeah. is not sexy. That is fine. The, and that's, that's so exactly that, the... That's one challenge that we have to take away. How do we solve it? We'll find a model that solves it somewhere yes. else. That's all I want to yeah. hear, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I understand what you're saying, but this is where usually I convince them that it's in their best interest to take ownership. Yeah. So yeah. from your conversation, what I want to find out is what are your major challenges and just share that. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. So okay. one, any yeah. other? Do you have money issues? Yeah. <laughs> I think everyone has money issues. Yeah. Everybody has yeah. money issues if you ask them, right? Yeah. But do you have real money issues? No. No. Okay. Because, uh, I, don't, I haven't invested yet. I have an idea and prototypes and the next step. But then in the next step, always have use to other money. people's money when you can. You never want to use your own money. That's actually not a very smart idea. This is why you need grants, you need different institutions to carry you. This is actually how you're going to keep the equity as well. It's called bootstrapping, right? Somebody, especially government, should do something about this. You see? So think about it and I'll come back to this, okay? about the stakeholders and their role, they usually do not understand their role and they do not actually act. So what, what's important first to understand who the stakeholders are, most people have not mapped out the stakeholders. Number one. Number two, you need to bring everybody on the same table to try to understand them. So, uh, no, it, it, there, there are only two technologies right that they they're talking about so this was meant to be more of the discussion on how we actually create more of these type of environments out there do you want to hear about that technology philip is here okay so i can ask philip to present that technology which was he talked about it which you know okay okay Okay, so I am going to get this discussion wrapped up. I would just like some volunteer to talk about what they found. Not everybody, maybe this group. And any other group wants to talk? This group? Two groups? 
Then I have a request to actually have you present your technologies, okay, from the audience. We will honor that, and then we'll have him talk about his to present the, your technology, the Philip. Yes, your slide. Yes, okay. So can we have this group? Can you? So can we have you talk about your findings? Two to three. Okay, so um, so we all, we've all got very, very similar problems, financing, collaboration, um, IP protection. Um, one of the things that, that's become very obvious for us is that um, we get the need to build the ecosphere, um, the ecosystem up, but the question that we have as a group is time, because that takes time, yeah. and in that time we all die. Yes. So there's the, the time pressure that we have is very different from the time pressure that government has. Yes. So that's the biggest finding I think that we have. Everything else is fairly standard, you know, start up, we all lack funding. We all, um, we're all searching for angel investors. We're all um, looking for collaboration elsewhere. But at the end of the day, time is everything to us. Well, thank you. So we have some comments about money, IP, and other things in this group. I would like to hear from this group. So we discussed what are we here for? That was your question. Yeah. So we are we were here for from uh, uh, for different uh, from different countries and different organizations and different interests. So we are here for to learn, but also maybe to spread the idea, to spread the products we sell, um, to learn people know who we could uh, get networking with. Uh, second question, we discussed how to spread the message, how to uh, try to convince uh, on the market side. That's why that means we, we do have uh, products, uh, we do only have a, a limited market, market. So we discussed that maybe people that, that other organizations may not be so much interested in supporting us financial wise because the market is not they are the big market. So we uh, discovered we are using Facebook as one, or here, this uh, person, uh, lady, is the um, media manager who informed us or who or told us different possibilities uh, Edward Grant, um, uh, Edware, um, and, and others. So to use these channels to spread the message. That was the two, and uh, we couldn't really. Maybe you have something to add? Um, we would have liked to discuss further, but we did not have the time. And we do that for afterwards. Well, thank you. I think, uh, and, and I'm going to go along the same line because I asked the questions and then I walked over there. The other group said we're here to understand about technologies and I will honor that request and make sure that Philip present, right? This is why I say we're going to hack it because first of all, for us to understand the problem we have to deal with, it's massive, it takes a lot of time. Two, you, we are not going to get anywhere in inclusion if we don't start thinking about the environment for inclusion, which is my personal goal to try to make sure we think about the environment for inclusion and how we are fostering this environment. Otherwise, you will just get a lot of energy burning out these young people investing their own money or their parents' money or whoever's money but we're not getting anywhere. They need access to market, they need access to technology, they need access to fund, they need access to everything. Anybody wants to add to that before we go into the presentation for Philip? Yes? Do you wanna add something? Okay, so we'll go to present your technology. Um, okay. Um, 
Uh, so, blind people are unable to uh, receive visual inf information on smart devices, as I, as I said before, and um, uh, therefore there is a lot of digital content they cannot access or use. This is minimizing their options and potential in the fast-changing and digitalized world where so much relies on visual information. And that is why we invented and developed technology which enables blind to feel pictures and shapes on a touch screen. Uh, so our technology uses a haptic sound, speech, and uh, visual feedback, uh, providing a multi-sensory experience that helps the user to visualize what is on screen. So Philip's goal is to remove the gap in inclusion and accessibility. So in spite of uh, their disability, that blind people, we want them to have the same opportunities and also to be able to compete with sighted people. So uh, we want them to develop their beautiful minds to the full potential. Um, well, uh, at the beginning uh, of the startup, uh, to, to have a startup, it is, it is hard. Uh, you first have an idea but then you have to get funding, prepare a prototype, test it, find the right team members, and uh, finally develop everything and start commercialization. Uh, the key to the right social uh, innovation environment is the interaction and collaboration with stakeholders and organizations. Uh, in our case, we get a lot of help from association of parents of blind children in Slovenia. As I said, they gave us a lot of emotional and practical support. They also became our first customers and ambassadors. And with their help, and of course with the help of their uh, children, uh, we were able to develop Philip and to come this far. Um, as I said before, we, we started building our social proof by uh, joining competitions, uh, lots of social challenges and innovation challenges to present our, 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 our project, our, 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 our solution. And we, met, we won many awards. And most important, uh, we, have, we are the best social innovation in Europe and the WSA gave us the best innovation in the world. And as I said, UNESCO ranked Philip among 150 innovations that will change the world for the better. Um, and with this, we also got a grant which uh, helped us to expand our team and uh, continue the development. And with that also, uh, we got our customers and then later also uh, investment, investors who, who invested in Philip. We created apps and content uh, with the help of, um, and this is very important, we created them with the help of uh, blind and visually impaired parents and teachers, Tiflo pedagogues, so we had an expert uh, also uh, working on this, so we have their approval that this is really um, working and this is the right way to do it. Um, we contacted schools for blind not only in Slovenia, but uh, in Slovenia there is only one, but uh, also abroad. And we send them Philip for testing, and we get uh, their reviews. So we get a good, uh, great feedback uh, from there. Um, now, um, um, now we are working in the, in the fields of education, entertainment, and uh, everyday practical apps. So to explain that, uh, we have an app for learning for uh, blind students to learn Braille, to learn geometric functions. Um, they can draw, they can play games like playing chess or uh, uh, Connect Four or uh, uh, battleships. So different different game memory, different games, um, and they can even uh, take photos. We have a camera for blind, so they can take pictures and then feel that pictures. And, uh, and also, before you talked about the browser and developing a new browser, well, we did that, yes. We, we, we based it on a Chrome, a Google Chrome, but we developed uh, our own browser um, because uh, it, it, it enables blind pe person to, 
to make a gesture and the picture which is shown can be then open in a Philip uh, gallery uh, app which then uh, describes what's on the picture and they can then feel it. So we had to build a browser because uh, uh, Google uh, Chrome doesn't allow uh, plugins on, uh, on, uh, on, uh, on Android, you know, so we had to do it, you know. So now, now, uh, now we integrated all this together. Um, uh, as, I, as I said, we plan to scale up the impact of our innovation uh, the, um, uh, and um, um, just, just one. Um, yeah, and uh, to to scale up our impact, um, we are working on a Philip Open platform. Uh, this is um, this is um, uh, its aim is to build a community and unite all stakeholders. So Philip Open platform will work as an app and a content store, and will allow everyone to have easy access to harness Philip technology. And we are here inviting other developers and content creators, as well as teachers for blind and parents and also blind people uh, to, to join to, um, to uh, in this way, the new ideas and good practices will be quickly and easily shared among the community. Um, we are also working on a new uh, pilot project right now. We want to uh, build an uh, interactive navigation system for blind. So. Um, this is um, uh, a thing we, are, we want to do with uh, one museum in Slovenia, where we want to build an indoor navigation system, which is upgraded with the Philip, so that blind people would be able to feel the floor plan of a building and to be able to say, okay, take me to the restaurant or to the toilet. Um, and uh, on the top of that is also an audio guide, uh, which will then uh, explain to people what is what is in front of them, what, what exhibits are there, and so. And wh how we want to to do it? We don't want to do it in a way that we will build another uh, um, indoor navigation system or another audio guide, but we want to collaborate with uh, with uh, already uh, existing providers of these services, so that they can upgrade their their. Uh, uh, solutions with Philip, and with that, get uh, uh, provide blind and visually impaired better accessibility. So the point is that the blind person can come to uh, any public institutions uh, and um, uh, walk there around without anybody. Uh, so to be independent. And um, and there is also another thing that we are that we are. Working on um, right now, we we are working also on uh, on another uh, uh, system which will convert picture into sound. So this is one another wild idea, you know. And uh, but but we did some tests, you know, that proved that this this really can work. So uh, now, if everything goes well, you know, um, I think that we, we we will be able to make people actually see with their ears. Um, it works on the principle of echolocation, and I'm not going into details now. But um, so, um, so that, that this is what we are working on, and plus, of course, the the thing with the feel if uh, the the content, uh, um, uh, another games, and all this. You know, this but this is extra what I what I just explained. Um, and um, to wrap it up. Um, so we brought digital content closer to the blind and visually impaired, including um, uh, digital multisensory entertainment and educational application, but we want to go further and uh, literally make them see. Um, so our digital transformation can be achieved, or any digital transformation we believe can be achieved with a strong innovation, uh, in, um, innovation and with ecosystem that will support new social innovations on their journeys. So. Well, thank you. thank you for that. Um, yes, question. Yeah, thank you, that, that, that was really interesting. But I was sort of, I, I wonder if Natalia could give us an idea of how the center that she operates responds to this type of innovation and change in terms of accessible technology. And hence also vice versa to our other three panelists. How do they link into those types of centers 
to ensure that their innovation is understood by those who are at the intersection with the client base. But Natalia, I'd be really interested, how do you cope with this level of change? Thank you very much for your question. Actually, I'm going to discuss with my colleague how we can start such cooperation. The first idea is uh, the following. Um, we provide trainings for specialists. And uh, at present, we are going to uh, provide a new interactive um, distant course for those who are involved in education of persons with disabilities and UNESCO has so-called teachers task force and me personally uh, is responsible for the thematic group uh, of this global teachers task force which is called ICT and distance education. So we are going to um, open to establish a platform for distance education and for um, probably information globally. It will be established by the UNESCO headquarters, not by our institute, but anyway. And we are going to produce new training courses for it. So I am going to discuss with my colleague how we can get, uh, I would say, case studies and provide our teachers or teachers globally with understanding how we can prepare them, how they can work with people who are blind, with students who are blind, and probably blind and deaf, as I could understand. Thank you. May I add just one word? We, the way we do the same thing, imagine deaf people never make a phone call. So we have to explain that deaf people can make phone call and how to do that. But how is came after understand that you can do that? So we uh, spend our marketing, so we act as a company to promote uh, half of our teams explaining that now you can make your phone call. And then we engage in the community some ambassador from the deaf community from inside that will do some video. And this is the best way. We also enter in new countries. Can you tell us more about your startup and what you're doing? Because we, we heard from mm -hmm. Philip. So, as I mentioned at the beginning, what we do, we transform a chat in a phone call using text-to-speech and voice recognition technology. But the thing is, that we're probably one I'm happy to, to share in this panel is that we are working to make all the services that go through the phone accessible. And first of all is the 112, the emergency number. There's still a huge problem in all of Europe that is, in case of emergency death, people cannot make a phone call. And there is no way that it is fully interactive as a phone call. You can send a text, but then the operator, when you come in the place to rescue and to find you, they generally try to call you. So this is the reason why you need a synchronous way to communicate uh, compatible with all the standard is the phone. So in your case, the collaboration, the biggest collaboration you need is with the telecommunication operators. Yeah, we, we tried, like, we, we found the reverse of the our resistance from innovation in the US, because we talk, I had the luck to talk with the vice president of Verizon, mm. and when I explained that this could be an issue for the 911, and it's okay, this is good, but we cannot handle alone. We have a, an organization that got all the time, because they define the standard, because we have to um, take care of all the minorities, and we cannot take any decision alone. So we don't want to compete with other telcos on accessibility. But this is slowing down uh, the uh, accessibility process. Anybody from the audience has a question? Because I'd like to turn to my colleagues from the ITU to talk a little bit more about his side of the story because the ITU has a role to play in this in that sense and I'm not sure uh, in the standardization sector whether we, we have any or we can provide any help in something like this. Any question from the audience? Okay, all right. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, so I, uh, this is the putting relay service standards into practice is the title. Uh, but I sort of uh, getting back to what um, Pedius, uh, your no, first right. name, I forgot. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, um, as I said, ITU standardizes, uh, and we have just standardized uh, telecommunication relay service. It's the, the newest uh, standards 
on relay service. People here may not know what relay service is. Uh, relay service is a um, uh, telephone service that enables deaf and hard of hearing people to make a voice call with a hearing person. So it's not like text message, it's, it's a call actually. So the, the, the picture here shows that uh, the person on the left is a deaf person, so he can either type or sign. And then there is a mediator called communication assistant in between, and she speaks in voice. And then the, the hearing person receives the call, just like any normal call, and he can talk in voice. And then that will be transmitted back to the deaf person, either by uh, text or uh, sign. In the case of text, PDS, what PDS is doing is that uh, communication assistant becomes an automatic speech recognition as well as uh, text-to-speech um, engine. And actually, this is an absolute necessity in inclusive society for deaf and hard of hearing people. Just, just as uh, he just mentioned, in an emergency situation, you cannot make a call. But deaf people usually do not know that they can make a call. So we have to tell them that th there is such a service. And this ITUT recommendation is edited and contributed by deaf and hard of hearing people themselves. So there are deaf professor, deaf engineers, deaf telco operators. Uh, they, they, they came to us and standardized this document. And there is a motto called nothing about us without us. And that's exactly what we did in IT, or doing in ITUT. It uh, describes current widely accepted, um, widely used telephone relay service, including caption service, which uh, allows person who can actually talk but he cannot hear to use a phone or a sign language or a text. And uh, the important idea is functional equivalency. It is not that a special phone for deaf people or, or, or uh, hard of hearing people. It's functionally equivalent to what nor ordinary people do, make a call. So it's not a special phone, it's, it's just a phone, any other phone. And so uh, this, this is what it is, and I wanted to say that this is a, a, a very good framework for uh, hard of hearing people and deaf people to make communications and to be included in the society, not just among themselves. And next steps, uh, this is where I, I think the, some of the things that uh, standards can help with the startups as well as uh, forum for uh, information. We're working on KPI, KPI is key performance indicators and requirements for relay services. And this document defines the key performance indicator for a successful uh, relay service. And we are collecting data from uh, currently available services and best practices in the world, everywhere in the world, especially uh, in the US and Canada and Europe, with the help from uh, uh, World Federation of Deaf and I, uh, International Federation of Hard of Hearing. And it includes requirements about uh, KPI, such as uh, availability, just as I mentioned, 24 hours, seven days a week, emergency calls if possible. You can get a call from a hearing person as well as calling to a hearing person. And then a uh, number of words per minute, accuracy rate, as well as um, uh, speed. And it applies to uh, qualification of CA and relay service uh, providers alike. In a sense, uh, you can uh, make a qualified communication assistant using this KPI. And it's agnostic as to whether a uh, automatic speech recognition is used or not. So. It's, it applies to both uh, text-to-speech engine as well as uh, automatic speech recognition as well as human. So can, you, can you tell us a bit, uh, so we don't get too much because we're okay. running out of time, tell us about the process to actually get a standard in the ITU or something like this. So because the standard will help scale things. Can you just briefly tell us? Yeah, for example, Pedius can come to us and then we, we have this KPI document that we can e evaluate uh, is, uh, speech engine, for example, and then 
we can show that this is a good one. So um, he can go to um, other telcos or any service provider and he can claim that this is what ITUT has certified mm -hmm. and this is better than other engines because when you go in any, any device, mm -hmm. any services, if you go to a big guy with financial capability, then they will ask you, why should I choose you rather than that one? And then ITU can give that uh, yardstick. Okay. And it's, so standards are especially good for startups, actually. Okay. So it's good uh, because we have to wrap up. I just want to bring everybody back to why we're here. I think we're all here for different reasons, right? Some people are here to see solutions. We have seen some. Obviously, there's a lot of solutions out there. In fact, we need to develop a whole lot more solutions. You have one guy struggling in his ecosystem, trying to drive everybody. He's only built a small community. He's got a lot of great technologies. Same over there. We have one champion who is driving these centers. There was a great question from the audience. They say, well, why aren't you using some of these technologies? This could be the showcase, right? Then you need him for the standards. Well, you don't know about him. Now you know. <laughs> All of you here have an actual role in, in, to play in the ecosystem to create an ecosystem that supports inclusions. My point and my goal is to try to see how we facilitate this. Now, I will just take one last comment from different people. How can we do this? Just make a quick proposal to us, right? We'll have one here, one back there, one here, one here, and our panelists. Can we just have, what do you suggest? How can we help accelerate this whole thing? From this side, last question and we're done. <laughs> I think we all learn a bit more today. What can we do? What should we do? Yes? Any takers? Okay, I'll come back. What should we do? Go ahead. Hi, I'm Mena. I have guide me in have a booth upstairs. We can work together. We can support blind people. We can support uh, people of hard of hearing. Uh, we can navigate them. We can work together. Okay. Over there. I, I would say that uh, there's a couple of things we can do. The first is to understand that we work within an escalated model. The types of technologies that Martin talked about that are integrated into operating systems provide a foundation upon which we can build. The more proprietary systems can then build upon that baseline that's shifting and moving all the time. The other thing which I think we should explore much more when we talk about entrepreneurship is working in the open. If you genuinely want to stimulate collaboration, then it's not just about the collaboration of proprietary solutions. It's about working in the open, using open licensing, so that everything from the code to training to support can be delivered using open approaches. It means a different business model, but it can be very effective. Okay. Anybody else from the audience? Yes, go ahead. Yes. Okay, uh, what I think we have to do <coughs> is to talk about these, uh, about accessibilities in open, not only to the blind, per, like in our case to the uh, blind and visually impaired people, but also to the sighted people, like spread the general word, or using channels that are used to general public and to spread the word about it, so everyone will think about it and it will go easier from mouth to mouth to, uh, through different channels, so not just inside uh, our areas where we are dealing with these uh, problems, but actually also to the outside, outside of our room here. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Our panelists, any suggestion? Quick, five seconds. What should we do? Let's start here. Definitely more, more events like this to, to connect people because <laughs> we were sitting on the same table and probably we were waiting for two years with the European Commission speaking with wrong people. And definitely this could be more shaking more the ecosystem, create more movement. Okay. Um, I agree with you, Lorenzo, completely. So, yeah, um, I was thinking all the time, well, how can we improve this? And uh, 
I don't know, if we want to write everything down, you know, then it gets too complicated, too many information, you know. So, so what we need to do, I don't think that computer can solve this, you know. We need to just talk with other people, you know. That's humans. I think that's, that's the solution, yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you for this forum because I think it is a first step to get collaboration and cooperation in this field. And in addition to it, I think that it will be useful to have some joint global platform for different stakeholders which are involved in accessibility and inclusion in different areas. Thank you. Yeah. Um I, I think um, if we can plug in some innovative, innovative um, ideas and concepts and products into existing services, such as uh, telephone service, for example. And that would help startups to make money, sort of, because they are connected with the existing uh, infrastructure already. And that would uh, propagate their technologies more, and people will be happier and, because people know that they can rely on those technologies. Okay, I guess I'll have the last word. I think we need to speak the same common language. We don't, right? We have to understand, we have to start understanding what we don't understand that we don't understand. And we have to build communities. This is my thing. I think, uh, thank you very much uh, for everybody for their contribution and thank you to our panelists for their great contribution and sharing their experiences. I learned a lot, so I hope you all enjoyed, and uh, I'll see you around. Thank you.